down to a low spot and then up to a high spot. So 40 thousandths of an inch, we now have 20 on half the lane, the other 20 on this half the lane. So we're dividing 40 by 20 now instead of basically dividing 40 by 40. So the slope per board on all the boards on this lane in different directions is now 2 thousandths slope per board. Okay? <clears throat> all right, now this is the, the top example, also within the 40 thousandths tolerance. You see it's a 1 thousandth slope per board. And this is an example of just some different slopes. We have depression over here, depression over here, crown over here. And based on where all of these things are, the slope per board is different in different spots. Okay? All calculated by the number of boards it's going across. If you're 40,000 slope per board across five boards, it'll be an 8 thousandths slope per board. If it's 40 thousandths and that slope is across 10, it'll be 4 thousandths slope per board. If you happen to be going here, it's, it's flat if you're playing in the, the track part of the line. All right? Okay, uh, is legal good enough? This is a, 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 a very, very good illustration of crosswise tilts and crowns and depressions. Let's take this table as an example. Let's say this table has crowns and depressions on it, okay? And that's illustrated right here. All right, this is the crown on top of the crown right here. There's very little slope right here. It's pretty flat. On the outsides, where it's coming from the high spot down to the low spot, also flat on both sides. But it's the slope where it goes from the high spot to the low spot where there is a slope that will have an influence on the bowling ball. This side in this direction, that side in this direction. Okay? Now, crosswise tilt is measured independently of crowns and depressions. So this has all of those crowns and depressions. Then I can lift this table up and tilt it. Same crowns and depressions on the lane, but now it's tilted. You see, by adding that crosswise tilt to the exact same shape of crowns and depressions, that the influence of where the ball is going is completely different. All right, here where it was flat, it now has influence to the right. Over here, where we had slope before, it's now flat. There is no influence. So the crosswise tilt and crowns and depressions have to both be factored in together to give us the total picture of how the influence of the ball uh, is going to is going to be affected. Okay. All right, this, this particular graph here, what we've done, the top graph, it's one of those kind of small for you guys to see, but we take all of these different measurements of all these different spots on the lane. And all the spots that are green are all spots that are within 10 thousandths of an inch. All right, all the spots that are yellow are 10 to 20 thousandths of an inch. All the spots that are orange are 20 to 40 thousandths of an inch, so legal but getting towards the illegal range. And all of the spots that are red are above 40 thousandths of an inch. So in the middle of the lane here, this is where the problem is. This is a depressed lane. So in the middle, it's depressed. All right, there's some spots that are depressed more than 40 thousandths of an inch. Okay? This is the inverse of that. This is basically saying with these measurements of crowns and depressions, these are the spots on the lane that are going to move the bowling ball in different directions. So the middle where all the problems are is actually where it's flat. All right? It's on the sides getting to that flat spot is where the bowling ball is going to be moved. So you see here all of the greatest influence spots on the slope or board are on the side of the slope here moving the ball that way, and for a left-handed player, all the sides of the slope here, moving the bowling ball that way, okay? All right, this is the same influence chart, and you see this, uh, the blue arrow is moving the ball to the right, and red indicates moving the ball to the left. The darker red, the more it's going to move it, the lighter red, the less it's going to move it, okay? This is an example of a crowned lane. So it's a high spot. And on the sides of those high spots here, you get the ball to the outside, it's going to move it further to the outside. And the same for a left-handed player, it's going to move it further to the outside. So this lane is going to feel like there's more oil on the outside. The ball's not going to hook from the outside as much as it would certainly on a lane that's like this. Now, let me ask one quick question. If we oiled both of these lanes, if this was 17 and 18, and you're bowling lead, and we hold both of them the same. 
Would your bowling ball react the same way? No. No. Now, are you going to get mad at the lame man? Probably yes. still. If you didn't know, you think it was his fault. You would think that, man, the oil they were supposed to put on all this lane, I think they put a little extra on this lane, and they got it wrong, you know? But your bowling ball is going to react radically different on one lane to the next, nothing to do with lane oil. Okay? Yes. So what you're saying, Chris, is on the right-hand side, with the arrow pointed that way, if we were bowling on a sport pattern, and let's say it was 40 feet, that if you got it to, to the outside of that lane, it's actually going to feel like it might be playing like 45. Exactly right. Yeah. At the end of the pattern, where you think that that should start, the influence of the lane will be moving. Okay. Okay. Now this is a 3D. It's a little difficult to see here, but this is a 3D uh, representation of the lane, the front being the foul line and going towards the back being the pin deck. Okay, and you see here the blue being kind of all of the depression spots here, and then here this lane where it's going and have all this, these high spots. Okay. All right, one of the other really, really, really interesting things we learned is how these shapes uh, that could be in the bowling lane not just affect the direction that it moves the ball from left to right but also how much energy that it has when it gets to the pins. I think we all agree that the more the ball energy, energy the ball has when it gets to the pins, the more likely we are to, to carry. Does that make, make sense? When your ball rolls out, the <laughs> likelihood of leaving a 10 pin or a 7 pin goes way up. Now picture you're bowling on a lane like this, and it's in a depression. And you're a right-handed player, and you're going this direction. Your ball is actually rolling the opposite direction of going the hill. It's trying to climb up that hill. And as it's climbing up that hill, it takes energy. I know when I try to climb up a hill, <laughs> it takes a lot of energy. I need a lot of water because I'm a ad shape, which is surprising because I'm a bowler. You know. Now, <laughs> bowling's got me very well fit, she has to clearly see. All right. So if it's perfectly flat, the ball will actually save more of its energy. If it's in a depression in the force portion lane, as it's rolling up that depression, it's using energy. So by the time it gets to the pins, it doesn't have as much energy to, to, to carry. All right? So crowns equal later hook, but they also deplete energy less. One example here, guys, about you know how we say, I am, I am depressed, this lane, unless the force of the lane is with me. Let's say you're bowling on this lane, and just not talking about ball reaction, talking just about energy storage. And you're a bowler that plays way deep inside for a right-handed player. The first portion of the lane, you're not going up the hill, you're going down the hill, all right? So it's saving more of its energy as it's going with the shape, it's complementing the shape. As it comes past center, and it goes over here, and it needs to make its recovery back to the pocket, it's now going with the lane again. So both directions, it's traveling with the force of the lane. So if you were playing real, real, real deep inside, that person would have energy storage of the bowling bat as opposed to be going uh, up the lane. All right, so how much? These are obviously some pretty drastic uh, examples. I mean, what you see out there, it all looks pretty flat. We're talking 40 thousandths of an inch. How much, really? So what we did as part of the test, I mentioned the two days, that we had uh, uh, the pro staffers here from Storm is we messed all of our lanes up, all right? And we had them all in a format called a boomerang. For those of you that don't know what a boomerang is, if you bowl 12 frames, you would have 12 different lanes. And you'll bowl a frame on each different, different lane. What's great about a boomerang is if when you bowl all the way through, all right, you make all of your adjustments on how all the lanes are different, all right? And you make your subtle notes and you come back and you do it again and then you try to line yourself up on all 12 lanes. But we had them go on six lanes, twice, basically. One through six, then come back one through six. And we changed them. They were different everywhere. So we had some right-handed players and left-handed players. So one pair was directly opposite of each other. So for a right-handed player, one hooked more and one hooked less, basically. And it was the opposite for a lefty. And then another pair, for the left-handed player, both lanes were flat. But for the righty, the lanes were opposite. So one lane hooked more, one lane hooked less. And then the third pair, 
was just like the righty pair, only for lefties. They were perfectly flat on both lanes for the righty, but the lanes were opposite for the left-hand player. So across all six, they were equal. They were all going to see the same thing the same number of times. But this format gave how much they had difference in ball reaction from, from one lane to the next. Okay? Now, we took some video. This particular lane, before we, we, we um, uh, hit the play button here, is sloped at four thousandths per board, okay, is what the slope is at. Now, it's also sloped at four thousandths per board the entire length of the lane. Now, to, to have that slope the entire length of the lane is a bit unusual, but four thousandths slope per board is not unusual. In many cases, we might see slopes much greater than four thousandths slope per board at different spots in the lane. Now, one is four thousandths slope per board influencing the bowling ball to the left. The other one is 4,000 slope per board influencing the ball to the right. Okay? This is Pete Weber. Is your Pete? Pete Weber. 19 miles an hour, 17.1. These two shots with cats are identical. Three hundredths of a mile an hour different. Perfectly flush on one lane. The exact same shot. Tenth of a mile an hour and three hundredths of a mile. A tenth a tenth of a board and three hundredths of a mile an hour, the same. Dead flush, three off the right. Watch again. <laughs> wow. Well, let me ask you guys a question. If you put your shoes on and went to go play the game of bowling, as you know it today, <laughs> and you threw one ball on the left lane, and you went dead flush. And you went over to the right lane, stood in the same spot, and threw the exact same shot as Pete Weber did, and you went three off the right, what would you think? Oil. Oil! Yeah. You know, yeah. How much more oil is on the right lane than the left <laughs> lane? They owe this one twice! Mm -hmm. There's only, that's the only way! Somebody, somebody it could possibly go that much straight. Somebody, somebody hit a button and left me a puddle. That's it, that's right. <laughs> These two lanes are oiled identically, and they are, you know, this, they look flat. If we go out, if you would have seen the whole bowling center, the whole bowling center looks flat. Let me show you a couple other, other bowlers and how it affected, same two lengths, how it affected their ball reaction. Here's Norm Duke. Left lane, I flush. Right lane. Notice as the ball's coming out of the oil pattern on the right lane how much just further it goes. It just it doesn't start its roll as nearly as early as on the left lane. The force of the lane just keeps pushing the ball to the right. Now, uh, the last bowler that we're going to show you is Rhino. Rhino's left handed, but the, the influence is the same. So on the left lane, up for Rhino, it's actually the tighter lane for Rhino as opposed to the, being the lane that hooks more. And the right lane, which is tighter for those guys, is the one that hooks more. So here's him on the left lane. Uh, the opposite effect for him. Yeah, left lane. And look at how much of the radical turn this ball takes at the end of the pattern on the right lane. I, I, I chuckled myself uh, thinking if there was a lefty and a righty on this pair. Oh, gotcha. If there, was, if there was lefty and righty on this pair and they started bowling together at the same time and one saw his ball do that and the other saw his ball hook more, uh, what the thinking might be going on in those bowlers' head? Like, holy cow, did. How could they be hooking so much here and not be hooking over there? They must have put all the oil from this side on that side, I think, you know? All right. Our testing has shown that this guy actually knew what he was talking about. This is <laughs> Sir Isaac Newton, you know? Gravity actually affects bowling, all right? This right here, guys, uh, is an example. Anybody seen a bowling lane that looks like this? All right. One of our staffers, uh, Don Agent, one of our great technical people, has been delivering seminars around the world, 
and he was kind of getting some grief from our owner about why lane conditions weren't right. And he said, John, I cannot paint the Mona Lisa on a piece of toilet paper, right? <laughs> Meaning you can only do so much with oil if what's underneath it has all kinds of problems or it happens to look like that, okay? So what happened? How did we get where we are today?